So welcome to today's webinar, Change Your Work Life for the Better. I'm Jenna Woolwind with EMC Leaders. I am a marketing content creator and co-host of the Leader in You podcast. And in today's webinar, we'll bring you insights and share tools that will help you feel more empowered to deal with challenges in your work life, which we all experience from time to time. I have Dr. Lila Gershfield, who is an organizational psychologist and developer of the Emotional Connection Process, or as we like to call it, EMC. She has written books and created online the online EMC Masterclass and a Train the Trainer certification so that you can teach it in your own company or organization. Uh, EMC is based on scientifically tested and proven methods of creating better team dynamics, dealing with workplace conflicts, and creating a more positive and cohesive work environment, and the results have been outstanding. I have personally been exposed to this process and this work, and I've taken the training, so I couldn't be more excited to talk to you about it with Lola and the importance of how and the tools that you need to how to change your work life for the better. So hi, Lola. How are you? Happy to see you, and I'm so happy to see people here at the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. This is an exciting time for us, and I'm super excited to share this webinar with you and this experience. So let's get started. As mentioned, we've all dealt with you know conflict in the workplace, and it can be awkward, it can be emotionally draining, it can take us away from you know what we enjoy about our work, and you know we search for improvements in our lives all the time, and Work is no different, it's our personal, professional lives, and we spend so much time alongside our colleagues, sometimes more than our family. And these relationships are really important and, you know, honing them and, you know, putting care into them is really crucial. But before we start with the solutions, I thought that maybe what we could do is dive into some of the issues, troubles, and negative cycles you commonly see happening, and that might help us identify or see what we can relate to, and then dive into the tools and solutions from there. So... What do you see commonly in the workplace? Yeah, definitely relationships are so important to us. And it's it's funny how everything in life is obvious once you've discovered it, right? Uh, just like it's obvious that uh, we know that there are atoms exist and it's obvious uh, that they are there somewhere, but we cannot see them, but we know that they're. And if you would, uh, you know, spoken about it 300 years ago, people would probably think you're crazy. I feel the same thing is happening in work relationships. Um, I feel like we meant to be in relationships. We're bonding relational social beings and relationships are the water we swim in. And if you take fish out of the water and plug it on the deck, it looks really weird. So um, I feel like when we uh, look at the relationships and creating better work life, we cannot isolate ourselves and say, well, I'm here just to do my job. I don't need to have a relationship with another people with people around me. Well, that's not how the brain works. And so I want to cover maybe the key concepts of attachment, which really helps us to understand the patterns that we get stuck in. And one of the issues um, I feel like uh, is happening is that people not paying attention to the attachment significance. What John Baldy, who introduced us to the idea of attachment, really studied interactions between mothers and children, and he started to identify these patterns that we have. So uh, why do we have these patterns? Well, we have, to, uh, we have to start with what happens to us when we work together. Well, when we work together, we depend on each other. That's a given. And this dependency creates an attachment in our brain. That's how our brain works. And this activates our bonding needs in our brain. So emotional connection is sort of the glue that holds the bond together. And you can really uh, say that the attachment science has really helped us to understand what happens to us when we lose that connection, when that bond is broken. We understand how important these bonds are. We started to feel stronger with each other. We start to feel more connected. We start to feel thriving. We start to take risks. And most importantly is we start to feel not alone in our world. So the need for emotional connection is really the most basic longing, the most basic motivator we have. And we'll talk a little bit about how the brain responds to these disconnections. But first of all, um, I just want to kind of like think about how important these emotional connections are, how important these relationships are. Because if I'm, if I'm stressed and I can reach out to you and, you and know that you will be there for me, you will support me, you will comfort me with that stress, 
that means I'm not alone in this world. That means I can deal with stress. I can deal with uncertainties. I can deal with all different things that are happening. But if I don't, I'm going to be stressed in life. So the code really of attachment really tells us that our primary need is for that felt sense of security with people we depend on. And we have to look through that attachment lens and we need to understand what does that mean, felt sense of security? What does it mean to feel um, important to other people? What does that mean to make sure that people feel mattered and that like we care about them and that because we notice that when we have a distressed relationship people start to feel anxious at work they start to feel depressed at work that really makes their life difficult I remember working with a particular team and she said well I don't need to have a, a relationship with my manager I'm here to do my job Right. And but so what happened is she did not re recognize that by actually isolating herself, by not having that relationship component with her manager, right? she couldn't sleep at night. She has all these health issues come up. Well, that's how our brain responds to the stress. So, what we're really starting to understand is that when we have that loss of connection with people, when we get triggered, our brain actually looks at it as a life and death response. So it's very attuned to how we look at each other, how we talk to each other, how the tone of voice, it's like in personal relationships. So we really have to understand that when our brain goes into that separation distress, when we lose that connection, it's an alarm for our brain. So the brain the response, either we become anxious like, like pursuing the connection because it's it's a survival mechanism or we we shut down and withdraw so both of these strategies or stances is a response to the disconnection that disconnection is really causes us to create more depression which is we shut down or creates more anxiety when we feel isolated and alone and disconnected from people we depend on Hi, I'm Dr. Lola Gershfeld, and I help companies master the art of relationships so they can overcome interpersonal conflict issues and keep the talent they deserve. The reason that disconnections are bad for our brains is because the way the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex works is that the amygdala has massive connection to the rest of the brain because the amygdala is responsible for our safety. It tells us whether we are safe in the world or not. So the amygdala is assessing that connection. And as soon as we get disconnected and we get triggered, and we'll talk a little bit more what causes that disconnection, but as soon as we get triggered and we get emotionally disconnected, the amygdala basically hijacks the prefrontal cortex. So all the communication skills go out the window, all the collaboration skills, we don't want to engage or we engage with a more anxiety. So our, our prefrontal cortex actually slows down. It slows down our cognition. We can't really create in, in the moment when we are disconnected. We can't really collaborate. We become very, uh, very less productive when we become disconnected. So everything is important for us to understand that disconnections are bad for our brains, for our relationships, and definitely for our work life. What triggers our disconnections? The biggest one is fear of rejection and abandonment. This is very important to understand, the fear of failure, of not measuring up. So whenever people you know, talk about the feedback, I'm like, let me give you some constructive criticism. Well, it's great when you have a secure relationship, but it's very dangerous for the brain to hear that constructive criticism from when you don't have a secure relationship. And annual evaluations, I think they should be stopped because all of that creates a negative cycle uh, of fear of failing or not measuring up. So there's fear of not being valued or appreciated. All of those trigger the disconnection. Fear of being misjudged or controlled. Fear of being dismissed, treated unfairly, and fear of being seen as incompetent. So all of these uh, triggers that can 
create emotions in us and create that fear of us of not being valued or important or seen can create a very difficult situation for us. And the way we actually behave to that disconnection creates more disconnection because if we um, disconnect it and we don't understand what's happening for us emotionally, we start looking at people, right? Like we avoid eye contact, uh, our tone of voice might change, you know, it goes up maybe, the speed of speech goes fast, people stop sharing information. And often uh, it's not that they don't want to share information, but it doesn't come to them because the prefrontal cortex is hijacked by this amygdala. So people stop uh, becoming engaged. Yeah, that's a big problem. Collaboration, creativity goes down, motivation and enthusiasm, and obviously performance. All of those things are really the signs of disconnection. And conflict, you know, is just the inflammation. The virus that is happening is emotional disconnection. We have to recognize that when disconnections happen for us is we have to name that, right? We are in a negative cycle and we're going to talk about just understanding that when people are creating that distance or maybe starting to approach with anxious strategy, which is maybe blaming, judging, criticizing, we have to recognize we are in a negative cycle, period, because that loss of connection is actually creating all of that stress in our brain. And the way we learn how to respond to that disconnection continues to fuel that negative cycle. So it could be that we are direct report and our manager doesn't want to talk to us or avoids us or maybe being critical. Well, all of that are indicators that there's a disconnection, at, even at least to recognize what is happening. So when you learn how to tune into your emotions, understand emotions and process these emotions, you start to actually co-regulate other people's emotions because we are co-regulators of each other's emotions. How to set like a really good precedence when like new employees come in so they don't come in feeling like, oh, well, this is just a job because right. that's going to start that negative cycle. And so kind of like, what can we do to make it very clear? Like, this is how we communicate and this is what starts. I think onboarding process in terms of education and how people actually impact each other, what triggers us, how do we pay attention to those things? All of these components help people to be more aware of it. I think yeah. awareness is number one. In loss of connection, we start to feel that rejection and it's not by choice. It's, it's our brain is wired that way. And neuroscientists actually finding constructive feedback in the, in an insecure relationship when you don't have that connection is back as criticism. And Jill Hooley, who did the research on criticism, criticism is processed in our brain as low-grade punches to the brain. I just want you to think about that because that is very painful. It hurts and it doesn't make us feel better. The same thing with Naomi Eisenberger research that shows that rejection is processed in the same part of the brain as physical pain. So stepping on a nail and seeing rejection on somebody else's face where you depend on these people like your manager or your direct report or your colleague is like stepping on a nail. It hurts. It's, it's actually physical pain. So it's very important to understand these patterns. And this is what we're talking about, right? To recognize what happens to the us when we get triggered and what, what do we do in that moment when we lose that connection? Do we start to pursue and blame, judge, criticize? You know, like when somebody says, oh, you know, you, you got up during our meeting and that's very rude. Well, what I just, I just created anger. I blamed you. I judged you instead of saying that makes me worried. Uh, maybe this is not interesting to you, or maybe I'm not, I'm not interesting, or this topic is not interesting. Now, I'm, I'm creating a better and safer conversation. So we go into that pursuer mode or we go into withdrawal mode. And withdrawal mode, basically they shut down or they, they avoid, they distance. Um, all of that is also preserving the connection. So both people actually want the connection. One does it pursuing, actively pursuing, and the other one withdrawing. What we, what people both not realizing is that they actually fuel the cycle by both of these strategies. The more one withdraws, the other becomes more pursuer. 
the more one pursues, the other becomes more withdrawn. So they kind of like feed off each other. But what, what they really saying to each other is, are you there for me? Are you there for me? Do I matter to you? Do I care about, can I call you when I, can I call you? Can I rely on me? Will you respond to me? Uh, as the withdrawal distances and more disengaged, the pursuer becomes more activated because the answer is no, you're not there for me, right? And the withdrawer says, well, how can I be there for you? You're coming at me so aggressively and with two knives in your, in your hands. So all of that continues to create more disconnection and people start to feel alone and isolated with low productivity and disengagement. And now we know that really disconnection isolate people and people cannot heal in isolation. I'm gonna say that again. People cannot heal in isolation. The more isolated you feel, the more exhausted you feel. In fact, emotional exhaustion is number one cause for turnover intentions. The more exhausted you start to feel, the more burnt out you feel. It's not about the amount of work. It's about the connection, whether you have connection with you, the people that you work with. That's what gives you energy, motivation, um, continued, uh, continued support, and feeling not lonely. One of the resources we put out, and you guys can download it, is the three-stage process. So this is the, the whole process, and this is very important to understand. The first thing is the de-escalation. De-escalation is we basically putting a cap on that negative cycle. We're saying, let's slow it down, right? Let's slow, let's create safe environment for a people to, first of all, to validate everybody's experience. There's no bad guy in the negative cycle. The bad guy is actually the negative cycle itself that continues to create the feeling of isolation and aloneness. So we do that by giving people the language of what is happening for them, just uh, normalizing their experience, validating their experience, and, and helping them to identify what are the, some of the triggers and raw spots, what happens for your automatic thoughts, what is the productive behaviors, and we raise the awareness of that negative cycle as the enemy, not the people. So why, why do we do that? Because we recognize that what is stirring up all of these behaviors is emotion. It's emotion that is what we need to work with. It's the emotion that moves us into that action. So the slow motion camera is one of the tools we use to slow things down. The six responses that we use to slow things down, to validate people's experience, to recognize how difficult it has been for them, how the negative cycle has really taken over the relationship. And definitely we give them the language for the raw spots and emotions because people don't have the language even to express what is happening for them. What some of the sensitive spots that have been touched in during that disconnection, during those triggers. And what we have seen in the, in the uh, working with team is the longer the negative cycle, the more raw spots you will have. So that means the more relationship injuries you will experience. So they start to see how they trigger each other, how it touches the raw spots, how uh, they have these emotions, automatic thoughts, protective behaviors, which triggers the other people and that touches raw spots, emotions. So people started to recognize what do they do? It's kind of like a dance, right? Everybody's dancing together with each other. But what is actually ha happening with them as they continue to trigger that negative cycle? So people started to actually learn how to call out the cycle in their relationship. So they say, oh, I hear that we're getting in a negative cycle. And the other person can say, yes. It sounds like, did you feel small and dismissed in that moment? Yes, I did. Well, I didn't mean to make you feel because I get so scared when you don't respond to me, right? So now by, by recognizing the negative cycle, by going through those uh, exercises where they can identify the emotions, automatic thought, thoughts, protective behaviors, they start to learn how to step out of these negative cycles. And people need to learn how to help each other to step out of these negative cycles so they can slow it down and, and help each other to regain their emotional balance. The slow motion camera is the ability that you have 
to slow things down. It's kind of like a rewinding the tape, right? When, when you watch sports on TV, there's a moment uh, on TV. And then what happens is they rewind it. And how many times do they rewind? They rewind it five or six times. So the same thing happens. When you get triggered and you are in a negative cycle, it's a good idea to slow things down, to rewind the type and say, wait a second, did I, did I get triggered by the voice, by the tone, by the facial expression, by the words? What specifically triggered me? And when you have the six responses, what you actually, you, you start to learn how to respond to people to validate that experience because people need to feel safe to be vulnerable. If they're going to be vulnerable, if they're going to share their emotions, they have to know that you're not going to dismiss their feelings. You're not going to uh, ignore you. You are going to say, I hear you. So one of the six responses is, I hear you. That must be very difficult for you. I can see how much this matters to you. Because again, we are always looking at the attach through the attachment lens. If people are acting out, it's not because they want to be jerks. It's because they have a dis separation distress in that moment. Yes, we all adults. Of course, we, we're supposed to act like, you know, we're strong and independent. But the fact is we're human beings. So we normalize that. Um, I was just doing the intensive session with, uh, with a team for three days. And the person says, I learned how to put a block between myself and the other person. Anytime I don't like something, I just shut my emotions down. So I put another block and then another block and another block. Well, now I have all these blocks and I say, that makes a sense. wall. <laughs> right, exactly. It's a, she's behind the wall and now she feels isolated and alone. So by using the six responses, you're actually learning how to give that space, how to hold that space for people so they don't feel judged. They don't feel like they're weak. They, they, they feel accepted. And that's huge for people. The number one would be awareness. Number two is acknowledgement. Normalizing. We are all human beings. We all feel that way. That's very important. And obviously the language. So the negative cycle is the key. You blame the cycle, not each other. So as you come in, like Jenna, you were talking about new people, if they start to learn how to recognize these triggers and learn how to have these conversations, everything becomes so much easier to deal with. Because what I think what happens in the workplace is you get hurt and you don't know, you don't talk about it, right? You don't know how to talk about it. You feel awkward, you feel kind of scared. But if you see that people actually bringing up and talking about it and holding that space and having that exercise role modeling, you start to do that because we all need to learn how to do that. The second stage is called the restructure. And this is where we start to restructure that negative cycle. The very first thing in, in, or, in order to restructure anything is people need to learn what do they need to feel safe and connected. And our attachment gives us a very clear map of what is it that they need. Uh, the key question in, in attachment relationship is, are you there for me? Are you accessible to me? Are you responsive to me? But so the first thing is to recognize, understand that people need to feel safe and connected. They need to feel they matter. You care about them and they care about you. And all of that creates a bonding conversation where people can learn how to turn to each other and share that vulnerability and be accessible, responsive, and engaged. Are you there for me is a million dollar question in bonding relationships. I mean, A-R-E, are you accessible to me emotionally? Are you responsive to me emotionally? Can you hear my stress? Can you just hold that space? I don't need a solution from you. I don't need you to fix it for me. I don't need you to go and talk to somebody in, for me. No, I want you to help me to have that space so I can regain my balance and solve my problem myself. That is how we thrive. That is how we become confident in our work. So this is very important, especially for managers, because they are key attachment figures. And are you engaged with me? 
even though you don't agree with me, even though you um, my, may not understand my content, but can you still stay engaged with me? And this is one of the things as people start to learn what's happening with them <clears throat> as they go through the process, what they start to do is we start to soften the pursuer because they have the language for emotions. They know what's happening for them so they can take a breath. They, they don't have to have urgency every every time, right? Because they have these bonds in conversation. So the, yeah, the relationship becomes more secure. And now we also re-engaging the withdrawer. So the withdrawer can say, I don't know what to say right now. I'm getting overwhelmed, but I don't know what to say right now. But I'm not leaving the conversation. That is huge for pursuers, for pursuers that are afraid that the withdrawer would shut down and not talk. That is amazing for withdrawers to do. So that is changing the cycle because if you don't have a response, you don't have a relationship. So if that question, are you there for me, is not, is answered with a no or a maybe, you have a relationship distress. You are in a negative cycle. But if that question, every time we do a bonding conversation, the, the answer to the question, are you there for me, is yes. <clears throat> because I'm turning to you, I'm listening to you, I'm accepting, I'm validating, I'm making that space for you. That gives me more security. And now I start to feel like I matter to you, like you care about me, not just care about my work, but you care about me as a human being. Again, and that is very, very significant for people. So the reconnection form, important tools in the EMC process. This is what you really learn in the EMC masterclass is how to use this reconnection form. And it's a guide. It's a guide for you to not get off in content because content is very interesting. You know, our brain goes into the storytelling. And we let me tell you another story how this person have hurt me or how this person is behaving. No, no, we're going to understand what is happening for you. What is the impact it has on you? So as you continue to do these reconnection forms with yourself or with, with another person or with your team, what you start to see is that the shift in the relationship, you, you start to see a shift in their understanding, in how much more clear they see each other, how much more open they feel with each other, because people want to be connected. They just don't have the tools to do that say that the reconnection form gives you a safe space to do it. Cause I feel like a lot of people sometimes in the moment of like having conflict or trying to solve the conflict, even don't their vocabulary sh shuts down and they don't have the words to say it. And this really helps guide and give a script and it puts it in such like a very, you know, eloquent way. And there's a guide and I feel like it's so wonderful and such a great tool in general. I remember doing the process without that form and I would get lost. <laughs> I would get lost in content. Like you said, I'm mm -hmm. trying to figure out who is right, who is wrong. And my brain automatically goes into that content story. Yeah. With the connection form, you really, like you said, you are staying very focused. And as I was doing the intensive session for this team, I mean, I use like 10 or 12 reconnection forms, right? Because everything is about that relationship. Everything about that I'm repairing, I'm creating a space for them to unpack the emotions that are, are activated during that disconnection. I'm giving the voice for them to slow it down. Like you see the image, the bodily sensation, the worst fear about yourself, all of those things slows the amygdala down. And when I validate, what am I doing? I'm talking to the amygdala. I'm relaxing the amygdala. So by the time I get to the automatic thoughts and protective behaviors, my prefrontal cortex is fully engaged. Now it's, it says, oh, oh, so when I get triggered, this is what I think. I start to think I give up. How dare you? You know, I want to get away. And what do I do? I shut down or I become more aggressive. I start to demand that realization. Just imagine how people change in behavior when they have that realization. It is transformational. And people start to actually learn how to ask for what they need. Because if you don't ask for what you need, you're going to continue to be in distressed relationship. This is one of the things that we find in, in our research and in our work 
is that people have to have these three components to learn. What are the emotions happening for them? What are the fears that are going on when, when they are, get disconnected? And what do they need to feel safe and connected? Now, in order for me to do all three, I have to slow things down. I have to tune into my emotions. I have to turn to the other person. I have to know that the other person will not reject me. So all of those things takes a lot of practice. That's why we have all these tools. All of that helps you to practice the five techniques that we teach about emotional responsiveness, validation, uh, reframing, how we actually reframing into the negative cycle so people don't feel like they are the bad guys. They are the ones to blame. That creates a lot of distress for people. We are also reframing in attachment significance. Look, you guys are here. This relationship means a lot to you. I can see how much this project means to you. You care about that. All of that attachment significance, we use it in the process and you learn how to do that so you can manage emotions. We are co-regulators of each other's emotions. So we have to learn how to work with emotions and how to co-regulate each other's emotions so that we can balance ourselves and become accessible, responsive, and engaged. This is, I think, the essence of emotional intelligence. People talk about we need emotional intelligent managers, we need emotional intelligent employees, but how do you become emotionally intelligent? Well, you become by learning these tools and exercising and tuning in. So these tools really equip you, empower you how to get through that. And um, the team that I worked with uh, the, for three days, they came out to be more emotionally intelligent because they become so much more aware, so much uh, more regulated, managing their emotions. So all of that takes practice and uh, using the right tools. It is interesting because emotional intelligence, I think, is often a buzzword. People pop out and say like, oh, emotionally intelligent, but like no one's ever really dove into what that means and the skills that someone needs to develop to actually be that and do it in their real lives and in their work lives. Exactly. So what we know from attachment science is that the biggest resource in our work, in our life, is emotional connection. And, and attachment gives us a roadmap. So Everything becomes so much easier for, I think, managers to do when you have this map. Somebody sent me this image, I remember, and they said, uh, dealing with conflict is like piloting a helicopter over a tornado. Well, who would want to do that? No wonder managers avoid conflicts at all costs because they don't want to be sucked into the conflict themselves and they feel so incompetent. Well, with attachment lens, it's like a regular scheduled flight. You know the plane works. You know how to deal with turbulence. You know how to get to your destination. And destination is always connection. The reason why people behave the way they do is because they have lost their connection. And they are falling through space, period. I feel like the last 15 years, uh, people like Phil Schaefer, Mario Michelangelo have written so much about attachment in the workplace, attachment in, in relationships, that we really have a clear map of what is it that we need to do to change the key organizing elements that will change the drama, that will change the conflict, and that will help people to thrive in the world. And as people continue to be connected. I mean, I see the transformation happens as, as they do these reconnection sessions. They feel relieved. Uh, the ice melts away. Everything becomes so much easier for them to, to accomplish, to acknowledge, to just feel like they're connected. And, and people love that. People want to be connected. That's what the thriving is all about. So it's very universal. And obviously, stage three is we want to integrate that language of emotional connection into the daily conversations. We want to nurture the relationship so we can have these bonding conversation easily. We want to create that safe haven for people to come back to and secure base for them to go out into the world and risks. Right? Every time you, people go out into uh, the client or deal with customers, they are risking. So if they made a mistake, they need to be able to come back and have that safe space, safe haven, 
where they can share the vulnerability and say, I feel so embarrassed. Like uh, this particular team that I was working, uh, the gal who was putting rocks around her, she said, I'm so scared to say that I made this bad decision. And now, Lola, you're giving me that space. And I want to say that to my team members, I messed up. I never talked about it. And I feel so ashamed that I feel like I'm a bad leader for this company. And the other people look at her and they say, you're not a bad leader. It's okay. You gave us so much opportunity. We have grown in this company so much. It's okay. And she's like, oh my God, thank you. Uh, can you imagine the relief, <laughs> the relief it feels for people to actually talk about these difficult feelings they have and then get the reassurance that it's okay. We are all humans. We make mistakes. You're not a bad person. Number one fear for managers is I failed. I failed my people. Uh, they don't like me or they don't want me or I'm, I'm ineffective. So when they have these bonding conversations and they practice them as, as you know as I do the sessions I kind of a role model them what it looks like and we practice over and over and over again they start to feel what that real connection is and real connection is fun it's thriving it's biology because when we have connection we have oxytocin in our brain we feel like at the top of the world we can we can address any challenge it's, it's key to all of our relationships and as people learn how to do that in, in the workplace, they obviously bring that to their personal life. So all of the relationships start to shift and start to change. And we want that. We want that security in all of our relationships. Whether it is hard, it's hard. It's hard work. I'm not going to lie about it. But the, the key point is we have a map and that map works. Hi, I'm Dr. Lola Gershfeld, and I help companies master the art of relationships so they can overcome interpersonal conflict issues and keep the talent they deserve. We want to create more secure attachment. So in secure attachment, the brain, the amygdala, it that is, doesn't get so activated so fast. So for example, Jen, if you're my manager and you don't respond to me in whatever time you know you said, my and I have a secure attachment with you. My brain is gonna say, "Oh, Jenna is busy. You know, she she will she's probably is doing something more important. It's okay because I have all these experiences where she was there for me. If I have insecure attachment, my brain will automatically go to the worst possible scenario, which is, Jenna doesn't care about me. I'm not important." She doesn't care about me. I'm not valued. And now I'm down the spiral into that hole. And the next time I come, I come guarded. I'm gone disengaged. And you're going to say, Lola, what's wrong? Like, why are you so, so mean right now? <laughs> and then the cycle continues. So the cycle is really important to understand. In secure attachment, we really become more assertive. I was doing the training yesterday. And I said, like, what, what would you like to know? in this training. And the people say, I want to be more assertive. I want to have better communication skills. I want to have an easier time at work. That's what makes my work happy, right? That I can actually thrive. I can actually feel like I'm myself at work. So we become more self-aware. We start to deal with emotions better. We become more empathic to others. We can't be empathic when we're disconnected. We can't. Our prefrontal cortex is not possible. We are in a survival mode at that moment. We start to deal with stress better. We become more resilient to stress. Everything becomes more open for us to learn, to thrive, to, to risk, to explore. And we become better as leaders and definitely healthier as human beings. So I, I want to share with you how important Important this attachment, how important emotion is, because everything what we're really doing is helping you to learn how to work with emotion, how to bring people back to balance. You know, we talked about emotional intelligence. We need to teach people how to be emotionally intelligent. And this language, these tools, I actually giving you empower you to do that. So it's incredible, incredible 
for us to, to share that with you. To learn how to work with emotions, you start to change the emotional signals. You move teams from conflict to connection. And that's huge. So how do you do that? We have different options. You can do basic course, which is emotional connection made easy for all employees. I feel like the more people learn about the language of emotions, the more they understand how people get into negative cycle, the more they can actually help each other to step out of the negative cycle. Because if you're in a negative cycle and you don't know what to do, guess what? You go to another team and you judge, complain, criticize, lecture, or or um, blame other people. So now you're creating more negative cycles. So the negative cycles actually spread out oh, throughout the company because you don't understand how to work with emotions, how to share that emotion with your manager, with your coworker and say, I get so scared. I get so scared that I probably failed. And maybe just even sharing that what is happening with you instead of blaming, judging, or criticizing helps the other person to be there for you. So the basic course really teaches you the slow motion camera, the six responses, and ARE a little bit, how to be accessible, responsive, and engaging. The masterclass teaches you the reconnection form, the five techniques, and really understand the negative cycle so you can create this bonding conversation to shift and to restructure the pattern. And the trainer certification helps you to learn how to teach that into your company. The more people learn about attachment, about emotions, the better the culture becomes because people start to learn how to navigate through this difficult conversation. Everything becomes easier to do. Learn all of these tools in all of, all of these uh, courses. Like obviously it helps like on a one-on-one -on -one standpoint, but how else does this help a company? What are the things, you know, that, are there any statistics or numbers or just in general, like how does this help a company and not just like an individual or like a one-on-one -on -one relationship? Is there things maybe, you know, financially it helps or what overall can mastering this really potentially help a company thrive with? Uh, well, it helps the company because you, first of all, create a better environment for people to work. It helps the company because you have less turnover. The part of our survival code, our thriving code is connection. So when people feel more connected, they feel happier at work. They feel less exhausted. They feel more supportive. So all of that, they, they look at the organization differently. Definitely it saves money. It saves talent. It saves the culture. It creates that supportive environment. The Myers-Briggs just pu published a study. It shows that 4.3 hours per week is spent on workplace conflict. Every employee spends 4.3 hours on conflict. And it can be active conflict or it can be hidden conflict. So for example, disengagement is a hidden conflict. Active conflict, obviously you have people who are pursuing, uh, but think about how, how much money that is. It's like millions and billions of dollars is spent on lost hours because people are stuck in these conflicts and don't know how to deal. So what do they do? They replace people. I, I remember working with this company and they said, if we can just get rid of one person, one person, this person is causing all the problems for us. And, and well, guess what? They, they got rid of it and get another person took their spot. So it's not the people, it's the patterns that people get stuck in. It's the patterns that we need to start, we need to shape and change. All of that is written in our book, Emotional Connection. And The Connected Culture, it's a very cute book. It's lots of tips and, and uh, techniques that you can use to nurture the relationship. But we definitely uh, highly recommend listen to our podcast. And uh, you want to change the cycle. Because if you don't change the cycle, the cycle will change you. Just like the other person says, I don't know why I'm angry all the time. Well, why is that? Because the cycle has changed this person. So uh, by learning, and it takes time, it takes practice times, but think about in five years, you're going to still five years will pass, but at least you will have a better sense of your relationships. You're going to have a better sense of yourself. You see that when people do that, they actually grow. They grow each other in these um process. Uh, they, they help each other and people just blossom. Very exciting. 
So well, if people are already spending 4.5 hours at work dealing with conflict, they might as well be productive. <laughs> yes, exactly. Deal with it and spend the time because obviously building any skill set would take time. But this not only helps at work, but it helps in people's personal lives with their family and their marriages with their, you know, friends. So it's, and it's really valuable. Another question came in and um, someone was asking just the general feedback about uh, emotional intelligence. When you coach people in relationships, are people comfortable or do they, do they open up easily? Is it, is it awkward? At the beginning? Yes, of course, because people don't know how, what the reaction will be. But as they experience the sense of safety, they start to come in and be, and take those risks. So absolutely, people will, will they take risks? Yes, if they feel safe. So that is why number the first step in our process, creating alliance and safety is so incredibly important. Uh, sometimes it takes a while. I mean, I remember working with this particular team where one person would say, I don't want to share my emotions. I, and he would just come and watch. And after about eight months, he comes in and he says, I want to share my emotions because I feel demeaned, I feel, I feel ignored, or I felt, and now the, the other people know how to respond to that. And that, you know, they say, um, thank you for sharing. What can we do to help you? And they say, and this, this person said, just be there. Just be there. Just make space for that. And even just having that opportunity to experience that difficult moment. For us, isolation is terrifying for us. When we become emotionally isolated and alone, we, we get scared. And so when we are able to recognize that and accept it and validate that, that's huge for people. As a role modeling, as you see how people respond and how the relief they feel, this is what people say to start to feel valued. I start to feel grateful, enthusiastic, hopeful, not alone, stronger, safer, appreciated, valued. This is what people want to feel. And so well, how do you do that? Content is not going to help you just telling them. you got to be emotionally accessible, responsive, and engaged. That's how we do it. Thank you so much for your time and explaining all of these amazing tools and strategies and the impact it can really, really make on a team. And in someone's life, you know, we spend so much time at work. And so, and also when we're happy at work, we end up doing better work, which just benefits, you know, customers, it benefits us. So it's just taking that negative cycle and turning something into a positive one really can have a wonderful domino effect if people really invest in this. So yeah, if you had one quick bit of advice of something that could make a positive change in your everyday work relationships, what would it be? What habit would you suggest building? So I guess I'm taking that as like just a quick start to to getting on the right track. One habit I would say is to call out the cycle because it removes the blame of somebody's to really understand that we get stuck. We feel or we respond to this, this separation distress that we have. And as soon as you point the cycle and you say the negative cycle is the bad guy, we got stuck in the negative cycle you actually start to have more empathy for yourself and the other person. It slows down that negative feedback loop, right? Where we start to see the other person as the enemy. So I would say one advice is really starting to pay attention when you get stuck the negative cycle and call it out. And people give names to this negative cycle. You know, they say like, oh, we're in a tornado. We got stuck. Just explicitly saying that from implicit to explicit is a big deal. Learn how to tune to yourself, recognize the emotions, how to use the reconnection form. I think the reconnection form is just out of this world. For me, it's the, it's the guide to creating positive cycles. So I love reconnection form. I just love it. As a, as a trainer, as a manager, as a leader, it makes me feel competent when I have these tools. Because as managers, we want to feel competent and we want people to feel competent and worthy. Carl Rogers said that health is about feeling competent and worthy with your own experience. I feel like this is a gift to people, to our work employees and team members, is we're giving them the gift of feeling competent and worthy. What a perfect note to end on. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was thank wonderful. You. And thank you everybody for joining us. And as Lola said, please reach out with any questions. We, our team 
and Lola are always available to help and we're happy to do so. So thank you so much for joining. Look out for our next webinar. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.